in the 1980s and she was she picked up one of these bubble paperweights here's a uh, an emerald green bubble paperweight and this weighs about two pounds and she said uh, boy if you had that on your nightstand you could really bonk somebody with that <laughs> oh yeah paperweight as weapon yes indeed <laughs> mark is the best he is uh, he is a hero of everybody in glass nobody has taken something so far with such thoroughness for so many years and pursued it relentlessly and gotten such wonderful artistic results. He's just a, a marvel and a model for everybody to admire. Perseverance. Yeah, perseverance over years and years and years, yes. Seems like the only way to go, but it's a very difficult road. So Mark, by limiting yourself to just spheres, you've opened yourself up to a whole universe of possibilities. In some ways now, it still seems to be opening up, but in some ways it seems to be like, <sighs> I don't know. Tweet, 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 tweet. <laughs> oh, this is gonna look good. <laughs> <laughs> That's Mark. <laughs> I started out in painting at Kent State, and then I quickly turned into a sculpture major because of uh, I actually wanted to deal with three-dimensional things, but I still had that sort of lust for, uh, for liquid, and uh, the glass just really sort of satisfied the, uh, the liquid desire, so I minored in glass. And then once I got out of graduate school with a master's degree in sculpt sculpture, it turned out that uh, glass was the only thing I could do that people would pay me for. Come on, baby. There you go. Hey. See? I showed the students how not to do that, and there I just did it. Isn't that cute? <laughs> Whoa. And then the whole history of it is just so rich. And once I started making spheres, it was so amazing because they somehow had permission to almost be anything. <laughs> the spheres ended up sort of being a unifying theory. They sort of it sort of unified all the uh, diverse interest in glass I had. I could make iridescence, I could make precision air entrapment, I could make growl things, I could make filigrana, I could make uh, historic marble types. Oh, glass is the very first man-made material. First made almost 5,000 years ago. It, it, um, corresponds, its invention corresponds almost exactly with recorded human history. So really clever humans have been doing things with glass for a long, long, long time. I'm shaking. Yeah, we live through our tools. We live through our tools? Yeah. Yeah, through our tools and through our materials. There's plenty of animals that are way stronger than us, but because you're standing there with a gun, you're going to win. <laughs> Which is a, an extreme example. There's plenty of animals that can run faster than we can run, but we can build a machine and go 80 miles an hour on the highway day after day. <laughs> this is, you know, this is what we do. The best tailors won, you know, the best tailors won. <laughs> Those who could sew the skins together tightest. <laughs> I was talking to a fellow glass artist about these issues one time, and he said, you think too much. <laughs> what else is there to do? <laughs> Sometimes I will wander in the wilderness looking for a new uh, modus operandi for a series, and I have just vague ideas, and I might make six or eight experiments, and then when I find the one that's like, oh, 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 cool. okay, that's it, then what I will do is figure out exactly how that works in theory on the color wheel, and I can plug that in in perhaps uh, six different positions with that exact same 
relationship. So I'm like transposing it into a different key, into like six different keys. I used the growl process developed by Simon Gate at Orfer's in 1919 to make uh, black and white geometrics and to make animal pattern spheres. And it's kind of a cased cameo. So this is an example of a black and white blank. It's clear in the interior and then there is a, a fairly thick layer of white glass and then a very thin masking layer of clear and then this layer of black glass on the surface. And this black glass on the surface is what becomes the checks. So at this point, this is an unarticulated blank. We would simply sandblast everything away, which is not the checks. So this is the articulated blank. So this was constructed with a very heavy layer of the enamel white. The enamel white is a heavy lead glass with arsenic as the opalizer. But it gives you the idea what the blank looks like once it's cut. And at this point, it would be heated back up to 1,100 degrees over a nine hour period and punnied up on another rod. And then very carefully, the surface would be smoothed so we'd remove the relief made from the cutting. And then a very hot layer of fresh clear is put over this and the spheres are formed. Now as the spheres are formed, the pattern is distorted going to the north and south pole. And in the final design, in the final incarnation, this warping and distortion has got to add meaning and value to the object rather than subtract. It's a, it's a challenge. There's so many different shears. So you want real sharp, perfect ones for the final cut. But for just ripping, ripping and pulling, just, ugh, just the most barbaric things you can imagine. Work on that thumb. What else? Uh, this. This. You just need to pick something. Okay, that's good. I, you know, I'm finding out all these crazy things since I've been doing this because um, I went through Walker's Mammals of the World and everything and I had to know all the Latin names to go into the Natural History Museums and so forth and so on. And so I find, I find out that, um, that in 1968 almost uh, 13,000, 12,000 some um, jaguar pelts were imported into the United States. So I wondered um, how many went to London and how many went to Rome and how many went to Paris at that time. And, uh, and so it's kind of it's kind of crazy. It's like uh, it's like by virtue of your incredibly luscious pattern, we shall hunt you to the verge of extinction. <laughs> I have to do that a bunch of times. <laughs> cross pollinating major disciplines is always a, a rich thing to do. So so cross pollinating uh, mammalogy and natural history and my and my discipline of, of glass art, and and it, it's, it's 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 pulling me by the nose to uh, do indoor safaris at the at the Smithsonian. And we went to uh, Harvard last spring to the. Uh, Department of Comparative Zoology, and uh, uh, it, these all start with a pelt, so, so accuracy is absolutely imperative. This is 15 years yeah, of yeah, development. Since and, yes. Yeah, we've been, we've been, I've been developing the animal spheres uh, since 1992. The sphere that took the longest to resolve was the giraffe, yeah. and that was about 12 years. You referred to spending one summer resolving another. This is a sustained effort over over oh, really decades. Same, uh, yeah, well, about a decade and a half. Decade and a half. Yeah. A mountain zebra, we just got the research material for that from uh, Harvard last spring. The, the, the Department of Comparative Zoology. Oh, yeah, it's very good. <laughs> well, the building was put up in 1846, and we were rousting through. They have 85,000 pelts, and we got several of them out that had, like, number 47 or number 110. It actually was from a skin of a baby. And you can see these, these little markings here. So, um, so one of the big themes is that all the life on Earth at the moment is just a, just a hair-thin uh, veneer. And each and every species is supported invisibly by countless thousands of generations that have come before. This is an articulated blank that uh, we're going to turn into a 12-pound, 6-inch diameter giraffe sphere. Now this is the spine here, this, these are the tail head markings, these are the big bold markings across the chest, and these are the armpits, and this is the belly. Now the giraffe is 6 inches in diameter and 12 pounds, 
because it needs to be that size to be in scale to all the other animals. It's the heaviest and largest mammal sphere we're making so far. It'll weigh, when this thing is all set up, it'll weigh close to 20 pounds because there'll be almost, uh, there'll be a four pounds or so of scrap at each end that has to be removed. This will just be the, 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 the steak in the middle of the scrap. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Wow, wow, it's just huge. You have to be a little bit of a clean freak with these really fine, fine procedures or you get scratches and all sorts of unwanted little bits of glass in places where they shouldn't be. It reminds me of those Air China planes on the end of the runway at Kennedy Airport about to start an 18-hour flight and he's got to have everything just right. And you know, they sit there with the parking brake on and finally it comes off and then they start the slow roll. Mark is just about, just about to take the parking brake off. So I'm rushing all around, trying to get everything in the right place, and um, you're just about ready to start it, you think it's all right, and you just like want to bow down and <laughs> cross yourself and say three Hail Marys and say, okay, <laughs> let's begin. We're gonna make a giraffe today, and the finished object will be six inches in diameter and, and weigh 12 pounds. And that uh, is a problem in and of itself, but the actual object during the construction will have three or four pounds of scrap at each end, so it'll weigh close to 20 pounds. And it will take uh, oh, four and a half hours heating it every uh, 35 or 40 seconds, <laughs> a minute maybe at a time. Years ago when I was first starting to pick up some of these really heavy things, I had one just about sling off and I had to shove it into the floor to <laughs> make sure it was stuck. I got the plug in the oven here, and I think it's about 1,050 degrees. It's ready to be picked up. Mark's reheats are very, very frequent, and often they're very short, because one of the things Mark wants to do is, is do a heat treatment on the skin and not have the whole object soften and distort. So he'll, at the end of this procedure that's gonna last over four hours, he will have done hundreds and hundreds of reheats. He'll be tired at the end of the day. He will be. Heat's an interesting subject. Uh, everybody talks about red hot. Red hot's the famous hot. But what about um, red orange hot and orange hot and, and yellow hot? These are all way hotter than red hot. Red hot's only about 1350. And then of course there's white hot. <laughs> so everything in the universe glows with the same color, with the same um, wavelengths at the same temperature. The viscosity of the glass varies extremely intimately with the temperature. Stripping is the process of getting the excess glass off of the object you've just gathered over. Mark does this by marvering, and he also carefully aligns the second gather and makes it perfectly parallel with the initial blank. The object is about 12 or 1300 degrees most of the time, and it's giving off a huge amount of radiant heat. So you'll see Mark reach in with a tool and do what he has to do and move his hand away very quickly because the larger the object, the more radiant heat it's giving off. Do it and get out before you're on fire! <laughs> Mark's technique has to be at its absolute best because he has to do what he has to do very quickly and precisely or he'll get burned. It takes almost an hour just to close the pattern at the end of each hole. Well, there's a, there's a tremendous amount of scrap involved with uh, making these things between a six and an eight to one 
ratio of the weight of material involved compared to the weight that actually ends up in the finished thing. When it gets down to that tiny little snip to close the pattern, the tiny little pee, and it's like, oh, and you put it in the bucket, you, you hear its cries of anguish, it missed its chance for glory. <laughs> I won't be immortalized. It would be easier to do this on the moon. Ah, yes, on the moon you only have 17% of the gravity, and so, boy, let's see, I can handle, if I can handle 15 pounds with fair ease here, then I would be able to handle five times that. Oh, we're almost at 100 pounds. Hallelujah. <laughs> All we need to do is pressurize a chamber, a subterranean chamber somewhere, <laughs> and get some fire. <laughs> <laughs> and away we could go. Oh, we could have uh, uh, 400 pound ballerinas too. That would be great. <laughs> All on point. <laughs> That'd be totally insane. 400 pound ballerinas on the moon. I think it would be the most surreal and bizarre thing. <laughs> Floating around like Rubens, able to leap <laughs> 12 foot in the air. <laughs> Imagine it. <laughs> oh, that'd be grand. I was making one of these and it was four pounds lighter than I usually make them. And I made the comment, this is a little one. And the lady in the audience said, it's enormous. absolutely relevant to it. You can't do anything to it that it's not absolutely willing to have done to it. So you spend half the time getting the temperature just right, so when you touch it, it'll do what you want. <laughs> I learned some German in high school, and uh, my curse is that my pronunciation is fairly good. So, um, and it's been floating up on me lately. It's the strangest thing. And so, so I'll have a bunch of Germans in the store and they'll be looking at something and, and they'll all be jabbering in German and I'll, I'll pick up another object and I'll say vielleicht etwas anderes, which means perhaps something else. And then they look at one another in horror like, oh my God, he understood everything we said. And then they start jabbering at me and I say, um, I say sprechen Sie bitte langsam und einfach, which means uh, slowly and one faceted, simple. Leider, ich verstehe nur ein Wort auf fünf. Unfortunately, I understand only one word in five. <laughs> and then they go, nicht so gut. <laughs> Not so good. We're cruising right up to the point where I can put this thing away. As soon as I get some more heat out of the center. We've got a great thickness of clear here at the equatorial region, and you can see how the pattern kind of swells when it comes around. I should force myself to fiddle around with it for another five minutes because it's just a little too warm yet.
darn it. Oh no. Oh darn it. Darn it. Darn it. Darn it. Oh. Oh, turn this thing back down. I want to think about it. Ah. Well, when he touched the cold. Ah, that's terrible. When he touched the cold gloves and the cold refractory material down here to it, it cracked the surface. Oh, it's the glass just jumping up and biting you. Ugh. Well, glass is the most unforgiving and most rewarding of materials, I think, in my experience. You work for years and years and years and you get better and better at it and you make really good work and in a flash of an eye uh, something can crack and drops to the ground. You just have to learn to accept that. Okay, forget it, just forget it. Mark, if everybody could go home and do this, what would be the point? What would be the point indeed? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right? <laughs> the more disappointment there is, the more exciting it is when it's all just right. Years ago, when people would say, I don't know anything about art, but I know what I like, I used to think that was kind of stupid. Now I think, that's pretty smart. <laughs> Because they know when they're having a, an aesthetic reaction and they know when they're not. And the aesthetic reaction is, is so basic, it's so basic, it's beneath language, it's beneath intellect. And um, if you have to know about this thing before you even look at it to understand what the hell it is, well, maybe, maybe, it's, maybe it's not art. <laughs> I mean, really. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> <laughs> I either like it or I don't. Why do I have to know all of this stuff? Why do I have to be in the 1% of 1% to, to uh, 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 it's been educated, all, all this ridiculous, and I gotta have all these guys in our money suits tell me I like it. I mean, screw it. It's, it's ridiculous. No. I, I, know, I know what I like. Yeah. Well, it's not so stupid to know what you like. I was blocked for a while with black and whites, and this has been just a, a renaissance of black and whites. That was such a thrill to be excited about a series again, because it's been a while since I've been, you know, really That's great. excited to go and open the annealing oven. Here's a checkerboard we made, and I like the checkerboard because it's absolutely the uh, quintessential black and white. And it has a symbolic uh, uh, meaning associated with the winner, the checkered flag, and so forth. And the real challenge is to hold the checks reasonably square from one end to the other. And in order to do that, there's a elaborate uh, warping in the blank that ends up sort of being unwarped in the forming of the object.
sort of, um, I have this weird feeling that I really am not responsible for it. <clears throat> that I was just sort of used to, uh, to come up with these things. This is a reversing twist onion skin with uh, 11 different colors of blue, a couple of accents of chartreuse, and the green aventurine. I've been making reversing twists in a number of uh, uh, formats and colorations for years. The chevron at the equator is very intriguing, and then this uh, idea of sort of ram's horn twisting in opposite directions. Well, there's something really interesting about the idea of a chevron. Uh, uh, you know, uh, it implies the opposites, good and evil, black and white, up and down, reversal, reversal of, uh, of directions, common theme. Okay, well, well, I'll get this gob here first and I'll coat it with white, and then I'll get it the right shape and get a single fresh layer of clear over it, and I'll roll into this, which I think we have about 11 different uh, colored blues here all in transparent glasses, and I need to pick that up very decisively in one step, and they'll all be stuck on there, kind of autonomous, and I'll carefully heat that so they ball up right where they are so they don't overlap. We've got to keep a minimum amount of overlap, otherwise they would all cancel one another. But I will pick up some accent spots on top of that in more opaque glasses, a little bit of chartreuse and some green aventurine from, uh, from the former East Germany. And that, well, you could see that on the, um, see with all the different colors. See, the, the, when these are the best, when these are the best, see, there's, there's, not, there's not overlap. And they, and they go into stripes at the poles and they hold, hold all these different autonomous colors. And if they overlap, that would, that would cancel. That one's not the best pole. But you can see all these, we already scanned that thing, but you can see all these different blues have been uh, just complete autonomy. Let's take a gather. Uh, uh. Yeah, just put that stuff over on the table there. What did you just say? <laughs> I said this golfer comes in from playing around at the country club and he says, well, I hit two good balls today. And his friend says, oh, I want home. What, what, what happened? And he goes, I stepped on a rake. <laughs> <laughs> we are ready for the last layer. Yes, we are. There we go. Oh, no, that's clean. Oh, maybe one little shrimp. reversing twist thing started way back in the 80s. I had the idea for it almost three years before I had any idea how to do it. And then I figured out how to make the twists on the end that's last attached to the rod continue just a little more smoothly with this torquing, torquing blocking tricks. Blocking all one way. Just started a little bit. Progress. So you're actually twisting it. Yeah, I'm twisting it by pushing. You can see the chevron beginning to form. Okay. Oh, I think that's ready. Oh. 
Yeah, I think we should stop. It, the whole, the whole uh, 5,000 year history glass is like a playground. There's never been so much information available and as a modern glass artist uh, you, you see these, these techniques that are just totally saturated with uh, historic uh, gravitas and you say, what can we do with that? <laughs> it's, <just really laughs> it's kind of a trap but it's kind of a liberation at the same time. And uh, to do something new with it, to do something that's innovative, something that's like Oh, something that you have an aesthetic reaction to the final object, and it's only your fourth or fifth thought that is, oh, that's filigrana. <laughs> if that happens, uh, it, it, it's a success.
of all the processes in glass. There's nothing more unpredictable than iridescence. Uh, what did you just say? It's, it's, it's interesting oh, because the, the, the iridescence is really an interesting thing because it, it hooks into the birth of archaeology in the 19th century. They were unearthing multi-thousand-year-old uh, Roman objects that were naturally iridized from chemical deterioration of the surface of the glasses. And these glasses, these objects that were naturally iridized became so popular that by 1870, Lotz in Germany and Tiffany in the United States uh, invented a way to artificially iridize glass. Tin chloride and, and various other uh, compounds was used to sort of age the surface when it was at a high temperature and chemically reactive. So we had this whole huge birth of Art Nouveau and mm -hmm. all these, uh, and Frederick Carter and all these massively important uh, uh, late 19th century uh, uh, glass artists. We are, we are going to make some, some iridescent marbles, some King Tut and uh, Indian corn patterns, hopefully. Now usually when I do this, I have a uh, furnace full of the of the black glass, but we don't have that now. So for the purposes of what we're going to do, we're going to pick up actual chunks of the black glass out of the oven. So so these are pieces of, of Fenton black, and here's some little pressed caps and things. And this will be the body glass of the piece. Yes, it's a pressed black glass cat. This iridescent stuff is witchcraft. It doesn't always work. We'll see if this cat brings me luck. This is silver nitrate. It's a metallic salt. Yeah, don't try this at home. Uh, that should be enough to kill a horse. <laughs> so we'll set up the situation where the surface is very rich in a varied uh, content of glasses with very high metal content. OK, into the sequence. The principle is to, is to have a variety of different uh, glasses on the surface all arranged in a certain way that have a, a different type of metallic content so that they will react with the fuming uh, differently and sort of illuminate the metallic content that they have. It's the tetraisopropyl oh. titanate. Mmm, yeah. delicious and nutritious. And good in tea. <laughs> you know, uh -huh. it, What's that got to do with this it? Is, this is the, uh, the iridizing solution that we're going to use. And, um, it's a, it's a metallic organic uh, solution, and it will react chemically with the surface of the glass, mm -hmm. and most of the organics will volatize out and it will deposit a metallic layer on the surface. Too much of the chemical makes a sort of a frosted surface, and he doesn't want that. Too little, it's so subtle that you don't even see it. So like everything else in glass working, it's gotta be just the right amount. The iridescence is very fickle. this repeatedly, you know, I can only get two or three tons at a time. This was embedded in the late 20s at uh, Victor Duran's art class house in Vineland, New Jersey. Right concurrent with the discovery of King Tut's tomb, that's why he called it King Tut. I'll try to make these aesthetic decisions. That's a real Van Gogh starry night kind of a feeling. Sure is. Oh boy, that's almost without any dents. It's so pretty. Almost. God, that's beautiful. The, the, the gods have to be with you with this stuff. Sometimes it works really well, and sometimes no matter what you do. And then when you're trying to find it, if, you, if, you, if it's not working well, <laughs> you only want to change one variable at a time. <laughs> How much reduction? How much this, how much that, oh, timing. And now here comes the titanium colliding with the hot glass surface. Well, it's a, it's, a, it's a structural color. It really isn't a color in the glass whatsoever. It's the structure of the surface of the glass that breaks the light into the spectrum. Very similar to a, a little bit of gasoline or oil floating on a puddle. There's no rainbow there, but the difference in the index of refraction of the two materials in that almost microscopic layer is what uh, actually makes the color. So it's the light being broken into the spectrum. Yeah, see, I saw, I saw the silver kind of spreading out over the dark graphic areas as I was, I maybe had a little bit too much reduction and it stopped like three seconds earlier. Oh, that looks great. Yeah. Get ready to put it away. 
Okay. Put it away. Well, it is a rich color, even though it's low contrast. Yeah, it was just a little bit too low a contrast. Oh well. I began to um, reproduce all of the uh, classic antique types early on, just as an exercise in understanding how they were put together and idealizing all of the uh, features that they had. The antiques are really kind of put together down and dirty and are not nearly as clean or nicely constructed as the uh, modern versions. They were never intended to be objects of contemplation. They were merely disposable toys. See, early on I reproduced most of the classic 19th century uh, actual marble styles and it really is enlightening to see how the materials were used. I don't like the word craft, I hate the word craft. I prefer the words material discipline. Because these very material disciplines are, are um, they're ancient, they're ancient and they're human. And they have rules, they have so many more rules than high art has ever, ever, ever had. What do you mean? Well, if you're gonna make filigrana, you're gonna have to sort of make the glass do what somebody made the glass do 500 years ago. So you're standing on their shoulders. Now, if you're gonna work within that medium, within that particular discipline of glass, and perhaps make your own message in that, you're still bound to that. You're bound to all that material discipline so that it's absolutely relevant to the glass. Now, how in the hell are you gonna have a fine art content, a real transcendent content with uh, something that's so, <laughs> so, so, so squished and spanked into a material discipline? Well, it's happening now. It's happening with glass, it's happening with ceramics. It happened with ceramics in the 1950s with uh, Peter Volkus and, and various other people way before it happened with glass. And the objects are so wonderful that they express some of the predicament of what it is to be human. At the same time, they are exactly within the bounds of these material disciplines that go back thousands of years sometimes. <laughs> it's, I think it's very profound and I think that the, uh, the uh, previous limits of value of some of these things are just going to be blown out of the water in the future. The globes, the spheres, the balls, in and of themselves are absolutely nothing. They're just a vehicle. They're a minimal sort of a physicality of an object to hold an idea. And within that minimal physicality, anything's possible. It's a paradox. A glass sphere 
cuts right to the, perhaps the most simple and durable glass object that can exist. And within the tyranny of the spherical skin, there is somehow the opportunity to express almost anything. I'm, I'm, I'm still shocked. 20 years later, after being primarily a, a glass sphere artist, <laughs> I can't believe it. I want to make us balls. There's still more things to say. difficult subject there is, art. And in order to get it, you have to be open. Your being has to be open. There's a gut level openness that's required to get it. 
It's about communicating with other humans. The other big tragedy of intellectual constructs in the 1970s about art was that uh, if a thing was beautiful, if it was drop dead gorgeous, it was automatically condemned <laughs> from artistic significance. <laughs> because, because beauty was passé. The avant-garde was passé. <laughs> There's been a load of it. There's just been a load of confrontational stuff. There was this guy in the, in, the, in, the, in the early 70s, I read about it when I was in high school in Germany, who made these happenings where he chopped chunks of himself off with razor blades and bandaged himself until he had to be taken to the hospital, hemorrhaging. And he did this repeatedly, in the words of Time magazine, until through acts of self-editing he did himself in. <laughs> I mean, this is confrontational. Now, why would, a, why would a human, why would a human be driven to such insane acts in the name of aesthetics, in the name of communicating to other humans? Well, he obviously felt powerless to create beauty because beauty was no longer relevant. Okay, this is a seven lobe rainbow. It's got 28 canes, 14 in each rainbow, and it chevrons from the chartreuse. It goes from the chartreuse to the green on the one side, and from the chartreuse to the orange on the other. This particular object has uh, two north poles also, so it comes to a perfect conclusion and constriction at each pole. Here's the other pole. The canes entirely pave the white. They are actually embedded in the white. You can see the, the grooves in the white where they are originally embedded. And then the surface of the color is actually somewhat distant from the white where it's embedded. Each color is a transparent overlay. So the white's necessary in order to even see the colors. And the colors are tuned very carefully so that their, their intensity is very, very similar. The transparent glass really glows, but it needs the enamel white background. These things have evolved just uh, kind of serendipitously over the last uh, 15 years or so, and they're at a level of sophistication now that I couldn't have even imagined when I first started playing around with them. At first, they only had six, uh, six colors, and they were always just embedded in opal glasses, and there was space between. And it was a revelation that I could completely pave the surface with the canes. The undulations are extremely attractive, and there's a slippage factor of where the canes actually end up and where they were originally embedded, which gives it a sort of an ethereal, um, nebulous look. I once saw Julia Child cook in a solid gold frying pan. She remarked how wonderful the heat distribution was. So even, so lovely. And it goes in the oven. I feel like Julia Child. Bake at 9-11 for an hour and a half. Pick up on a hot white core. <laughs> so this is the uh, rainbow lobe core. And I'll get clear glass and I'll get a heavy layer of this enamel white. And then directly on this enamel white, I'll pick up my 28 canes, which is unusual. This is the only design where I actually pick up the canes right onto the opal layer. I now pronounce this layer sufficiently opaque for all normal and natural purposes. 
I see there's nothing natural about it. very, very carefully melt these in, and I have to really take my time and do it just right. Now, if I, if I don't take enough time, I'll catch all kinds of unwanted air, and if I take too much time, it will be perfect still. So it's very difficult. You can never tell whether you've wasted time doing it or not. <laughs> and twist it, twist it so it's really twisted and get it just the right size and temperature and I'll ram that twisted assemblage down into this. And that's kind of a risky step because as it hits these broad faces going down in, it can push the certain colors under and over one another and that, that, that just ruins it. And then, then if, if you know, that goes well, then I'll get that, that crazy, uh, was it seven? The crazy seven-sided, the, the crazy seven-sided shape. I'll get that completely fire polished, and then immerse that shape into the clear glass, and that will um, have that contour underneath the surface of the perfect sphere. You'll have that seven lobing effect, which gives you the un undulations of the of the rainbow lobe. Since we're open to the outside, sometimes wasps will come in and they will uh, fly through the, uh, the fire, the fire, the sting of the furnace, and they'll have their wings shortened and they'll collapse onto the floor and they'll buzz around for a little bit. And a second later, they figure out that they can still fly and they get up and start flying around. And then they're really mad. I had one go down my shirt one day and the whole place was full of school kids. <laughs> and I said some things I shouldn't have said. something in a year or so and then you start making it you go oh <laughs> I remember this all the issues come floating back all the things you have to face there's that continuous problem that you make a correction 
and for anything good you do in one area, it hurts something else. Oh, oh there's that. always that right. balancing act. Right, right. Like you said before, you get it hot enough to do something, and it messes something else up. Right, right, yeah. yeah. I did not invent this pattern. This pattern was invented in England in the 60s. But this is the most symmetric one I've ever seen. I made this one in 1988. And I began thinking and asking how I could augment this process or how I could make this thing more elaborate. And I had the idea for the Super Jetson, which is this. There are deep, 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 deep grooves that produce the rings and there's a bubble up the middle, a single bubble that's been sculpted into this sort of hourglass figure, and it, it was put in there with a, an ice pick and a steam stick. So here's the Super Jetson, just a straight Super Jetson in a pale turquoise blue, and you can see the only difference is it doesn't have the BB bubbles at the equator. What's a steam stick? A steam stick is a tapered piece of wood. It looks kind of like a large pencil. And when you put it into an ice pick hole in hot glass, it seals against the hole. And the steam produced by that which is sealed on the glass side uh, inflates the bubble. Symmetry is a real challenge with these things. I'm trying to get the symmetry in the final, ob in the final object. I saw Lino Tayapietra give a slideshow once and he showed a, uh, a picture of one of his Saturns. And he gazed at it at the screen and he said, this one is uh, almost perfect. And that's kind of the way these are. <laughs> Even the best one I've ever seen that I kept is almost perfect. Okay. Ooh, I think they came right around in the same hole. Sometimes they come right around in the same hole. I just felt it go right into the same hole. I'd have to fake it. <laughs> it all comes down to the moment of truth when this crazy shape I'm going to make is uh, immersed back into the molten glass in the furnace. Up a little bit. And it's a, it's a real challenge to try to get the, uh, the pattern of the air absolutely centered in the uh, final object. Yeah, now this is the most critical thing, this gather thing. So, when I, when I gather this, now you saw this before, and when I gather this thing, I'll end up with kind of a horseshoe shape of glass over here. It's way too thick here, so I'll take these jacks and start right where I think the right place is and, and cut back and make that, make that ring, see? It's a, it's a constant push and pull and struggle between what you want as an artist and what the glasses will actually do. Too long. Shorten it a little. Come on. Things start out as just a lark and then they end up uh, uh, evolving and developing and evolving and developing. And, uh, Come on. and uh, uh, pretty soon you've got a, a fugue or a, or a sonnet or a minuet, some crazy form that you're, you're bound to. And then you invent another form. It's, it's, uh, it's evolution and then revolution and then evolution and then revolution. Constantly questing for a God knows what, but someday I may find it, may, may not. It's, 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 it's hard to tell. It's hard to tell. It's like the Wizard of Oz. I don't know how it works. <laughs> oh, come back, come back. I don't know how it works. <laughs> oh my God. I have to have the surface perfectly fire polished so that it doesn't interfere optically with seeing all that stuff. You know what? It looks to me like you have a good time. Uh, well, you got to really live once. You got to do something. I don't know how it works! <laughs> oh, it's up. Oh, ideas. Ideas, yeah. I have ideas sometimes, and sometimes it takes years and years and years to get the ideas into an object, even. But uh, they're kind of like, uh, like tumors. They hang on me. I can't get rid of them. <laughs> too, too many ideas. <laughs> 
I had this fantasy of making things that were so perfect, it looked like they just came from another world, a realm where everything was idealized. And it's almost that way because the, uh, it's so indirect. By the time you get it out of the annealing oven, it's, uh, it's completely set. So this is, this is my miracle story. A number of years ago, I was doing the uh, Philadelphia Craft Show, oh, the most prestigious retail show in the country. Thousands apply, and they only accept about 150. Anyway, we're doing this show, and we're selling all these things. And um, the booth was just absolutely jammed. We had a rush. We had a rush that went on for about two hours. And people were eight deep outside the booth. And there was this old, old, old lady with a walker. And her sister was there. And her brother was there. And they spent about 20 minutes and picked out a couple of marbles. And an hour and a half later, when the rush stopped, out in front of the booth, all alone was the walker. She didn't need it anymore. <laughs> I took it up to the up to the front, and the next day it was still there. So these objects have a certain power to make the lame walk and the blind see and the deaf hear. <laughs> that was most insane, wasn't it? Oh. It's just so expensive to pursue ideas in glass. Massive amounts of energy, thousands of pounds of equipment just uh, roaring 24-7. You can't shut the furnace off, it goes all the time. And uh, the pressure, the pressure, the pressure to make uh, money is intense. And so often there'll be an investigation and it will yield something that's uh, more or less commercially viable and you'll be blocked there, you'll be making that for a while. But I save prototypes of every single modus operandi I have ever come up with. And so as you're desperate to come up with something that people will want, and also express your own aesthetic concerns, the, the prototypes three or four that lead up to that are in the archive. And they're like little, like little buds, like little buds on a branch that never grew into a branch. And so <laughs> as things calm down and you look back, you can go, oh, here's a branch we can grow. It's, it's my modus operandi, I see, that's made all this possible, the, uh, the derivation. It's kind of like aesthetic engineering because the glass is very, very demanding from an engineering standpoint. So you're really, as an artist, in some respects, you're, you're, you're in a straitjacket. So to, um, well, to successfully seduce it to be what you want and to have the optics all tuned in an object, I mean, it's, it's so deceptively simple when you have something that's a success that um, it, it's just it's inconceivable to, to most people. It just looks right. It just seems it just popped out that way.
experimentation. Oh, uh, it's almost impossible to know what's possible unless you do absolutely basic research, asking the most basic questions. And uh, it's unbelievable that things like this have never existed before, even though it exploits one of the most absolutely obvious characteristics of the glass that's exploited to make every other glass thing in the world, but it's never quite been used this way. Well, that's intriguing. I, I just, I, I want to see what's going to happen next. And so the interviewer asks Sir Francis Bacon, have you ever been to art school? And he goes, thank God, no. How are you ever going to do anything original if someone's shown you how to do it? Uh, well, you, you can be zany about a lot of other stuff, but this, this, is, this is serious. Um, when I was in high school and I began to realize um, uh, what an incredible honor it would be to even even to be able to make a thing, to be able to make a, an object or to be able to make a piece of art that somehow uh, spoke about the human condition or somehow had universal appeal or somehow had longevity beyond my own existence, that this would be the greatest possible honor to have existed to, uh, to come up with something and it would be um, perhaps a worthwhile pursuit. <laughs> Uh, nothing else. Nothing else lit my fire like the idea of maybe being able to do it. <laughs> Just maybe. It gives me a reason to go on. It's so motivating. It's so exciting when you're going down some track and finding things that uh, that uh, you didn't know you could find, or you come to a point and you realize, eight or ten months ago, you couldn't have even imagined these things you're coming up with. I mean, this is uh, this is a uh, wonderful kind of a thing. That's what art is all about, these weird miracles. You can see when somebody's having a positive aesthetic reaction and it is transformative. It makes some of these elderly maestro conductors live another 10 years. <laughs> it's just incredible, the power of it. People don't retire who are artists. They have too many ideas. It's like George Burns. I can't die, I'm booked. <laughs> It makes me get up in the morning. It makes Tom Bigner at 82 get up in the morning to paint another painting. Because he doesn't have much time left and he's busy. <laughs> he's painting a couple paintings a week. And you? I gotta get busy too. Get to work. <laughs>